All right, so let's talk about ocean physics now. Um, the first one that we'll talk about is buoyancy in the water. And buoyancy was a principle that Archimedes uh, came up with. And he it basically describes a floating object in the water that displaces a volume of water that is equal to the mass of the floating object. So in the example on the slide here, you have an empty fishing boat going out and it's going to go and collect a bunch of fish. And once it collects a whole bunch of fish and it's coming back to shore, that boat sits lower in the water than when it initially started. And that's because you're adding more weight to the boat. And so it sinks just a little bit, but it's still buoyant. It's still more buoyant than the water because if it was more dense than the water, it would sink, right? But essentially that displaced water has to go somewhere. So let's look at um, this next slide here. If you have an object that is more dense, then it will sink uh, compared to the surrounding water. If it's less dense than the surrounding water it'll float and if the object is the same density as the water then it's uh, neutrally buoyant and it'll kind of just float in the middle of the water column so that's why when you teach when you learn how to swim you learn how to float right otherwise you would just sink to the bottom so how are ways here are some different ways that organisms uh, use buoyancy to their advantage. Uh, a lot of marine mammals will use blubber to help them stay buoyant in the water, but it will also help them keep warm. So it's a dual, dual purpose thing right there. Uh, fish in particular will use uh, swim bladders uh, to help them float or stay buoyant within the water. Uh, and swim bladder is a organ within their body and all it, the sole purpose of this uh, organ is uh, to be filled with air or to have the air taken out. So if they go down, if, if this fish swims down at depth, they can release the air from it so that they can sink down. Or if they want to go back up, they can fill it back up with air and so it helps them rise up to the surface. And then those jellyfish there, uh, they have these gas floats that let them stay uh, near the surface. And those gas floats are known as nematophores. And then on the next slide, you'll see uh, the nautilus right there at the top. They use air chambers. So you can see the right hand image there has a bunch of black chambers. And that nautilus will fill up those chambers when it needs to uh, come up to the surface and when uh, it goes back down at depth then it'll take the air out and it'll sink down to the bottom or not to the bottom but it will sink to the depth at which they uh, sleep at. Uh, that shark there uses a large liver like a fatty liver and also the tail um, is specialized so that it provides lift. So at the tail part, when the, the fish is, um, when the shark is swinging its tail back and forth, it provides a downward pressure because of the shape, which then causes an upward lift up, uh, near his nose part so that that shark can just stay at a very um, neutrally buoyant um, level of the ocean. Um, and then that human there, us humans, we use uh, what's known as a buoyancy compensator device, a BCD. Uh, so for those of you guys who go scuba diving, you'll be familiar with BCDs as it's a way for humans to go into the ocean and stay neutrally buoyant. Uh, so you, it's a vest that you wear and you fill it up with air and you either fill it up or um, release air in the vest to let you go up and down within the water column. 
All right, so uh, the next, that was buoyancy. So the next thing we'll talk about is temperature. And we touched a little bit about this um, in the chemistry section, but here's just a, a, a global image of sea surface temperature. Um, I believe this was September 4th, 2017. So you can see here that around the equator, uh, the temperature, the sea surface temperature was uh, very warm. And uh, in the polar regions, it was very cold. And this particular, um, when we get to climate change chapter, you'll we'll see a, a little bit more about um, how climate change has affected sea surface temperatures. But in this particular case right here, you can see um, the way in which the sea surface temperatures are displayed in the Pacific shows that uh, in 2017, we uh, were uh, coming out of uh, El Nino period and going into a La Nina, but we'll talk more about that later on. Um, and again, at depth, temperature uh, changes, right? So at the surface, typically uh, temperatures will uh, range anywhere from 20 degrees Celsius all the way up to 30 degrees Celsius. And uh, you have a section where you have a thermocline or uh, an area where you have the greatest temperature change. And so uh, generally that thermocline um, is anywhere between 200 and 1,000 meters. And then below 1,000 meters, uh, it pretty much um, flattens out and temperatures become more consistent and average about 4 degrees Celsius all the way to the bottom of the ocean. So now let's talk about light. Light um, is very interesting. And in the ocean, we'll primarily talk about the visible spectrum, although some organisms can see ultraviolet and infrared light. Um, but for humans, uh, we can only see the visible spectrum. And what's very interesting is when we look at the visible spectrum, only blue and green wavelengths uh, can penetrate the ocean the deepest, whereas the other colors uh, get quickly absorbed or reflected uh, when the sun hits the ocean surface. So uh, in the first meter, though, you can anticipate 65% of the light being absorbed uh, either by organisms or uh, by particles within the ocean but you're losing that much in that first meter. And um, to segregate out the water column into different zones, the top 100 meters is what's known as the euphotic zone. Basically, you have ample supply of sunlight, so you shouldn't have um, any difficulty if you were a plant um, getting enough sunlight to um, how do you say, uh, do your photosynthesis to create energy for yourself. But once you get into the 100 to 1,000 meter level, this is what's known as the dysphotic zone. And here you have significantly less light. It's much harder to perform photosynthesis within this area. Um, organisms can, but they have to uh, they generally have adapted other ways of getting uh, particles and food so that they can maintain their energy levels aside from photosynthesis. And then um, past 1,000 meters is what's known as the aphotic zone. And here there is no light, um, no natural sunlight penetrating this depth. Uh, you do have light, but the, that's primarily from bioluminescence. So organisms that can create or um, produce their own light, uh, but that's it. So when we look at this uh, next slide here, uh, you can see uh, you can see that of the visible spectrum, blue penetrates the deepest, um, somewhere um, past 250 feet. And then you have green, which is the next deepest, at 250 feet. And then you have uh, violet and yellow. And then you have orange and red. 
Red doesn't penetrate the deep, um, very deep at all, primarily because of how short of a wavelength it is, and because, or I think it's long actually, because of how long of a wavelength it is, and uh, because a lot of biology use that red that red wavelength in photosynthesis, so that particular um, color gets filtered out much sooner. And so in this sense, because blue penetrates the deepest, that's the reason why we as humans see the ocean as blue. Um, and so here are some interesting ways that biology used light uh, in the ocean. So for, photo, uh, for plankton, they use it for photosynthesis primarily. And then algae, um, you have red, brown, and green algae that use it also for photosynthesis. Um, <clears throat> and then you have these what's known as predator-prey relationship, relationships. So for instance, that shark over there, that shark is displaying what's known as counter shading. And that shark has a white bottom and a dark top. And so let's just say we're out swimming in the ocean and we look down at this shark who's swimming below us, we would have theoretically a harder time seeing him because he is blending in with the darkness below him. But if we were swimming below him and he was above us and we looked up to see if he was up above us, we would have a harder time seeing him because he has that lighter color uh, belly. He is uh, able to blend into the surface where there's a lot of light. It's much lighter in color. So therefore we would have a harder time seeing him. And then uh, some organisms do what's known as diurnal vertical migration. So they sleep down at depth during the daytime to uh, avoid their predators that are awake during the daytime. And at night, they come back up to the surface to feed. Um, and that way their predators are asleep and they don't have to worry about um, anybody hunting them. Uh, so, and then when the daylight comes back around again, then they go back down and they sleep. So they have this kind of opposite schedule, but it works for them. And then you also have bioluminescence. And this is where an organism uh, creates its own source of light, uh, generally using bacteria of some sort. Uh, and this is generally uh, in the deep ocean. Uh, but you can see bioluminescence at, at the surface. Some uh, phytoplankton will uh, create their own, bio, uh, their own light source, uh, which is really cool. You can see it here in Hawaii um, at certain times of the year. And then another very interesting thing that happens when it passes through water is it, look, it, it appears to bend. And so when you look at this uh, flask right here with water and the pencil in it, it looks like the pencil is broken, but actually it's not. Uh, what happens is the light is refracted or it bends when it goes from uh, one density to another. And because the density of air is much lighter than the density of the water, that light going into the water slows down. And so that's why it appears, the pencil appears to have shifted. So let's talk about density now. So here are the uh, densities for air, fresh water, and salt water. And as you can see, air is the, the lightest and it's also the least dense, but it is, uh, and it's also compressible. So when you put it in a container and you try to push it together, um, the molecules will come closer and closer together and increase its density. Um, but when you look at fresh water and salt water, they have very similar densities, but salt water is a little bit more dense because it has the salt that's uh, occupying those empty spaces in between the molecules. But unlike air, water is not compressible. So you can't put it in a container and you can't put it down on it um, and you can't release the, the air, uh, the air, the space in between the molecules like you do in air. Uh, 
So that's the reason why we can, humans can go scuba diving using compressed air. Now, if we look at um, how we determine density, uh, it's really easy to determine density when you know what the temperature and the salinity is. If you know what the temperature is, then you can tell whether the water will be more dense or less dense. So in this case, if the temperature of the water is warmer, you're going to find less dense water than if it's colder. Because if it's colder, those molecules aren't moving around as fast. They're coming closer together. Versus in warm water, those molecules are, are moving around really quickly. They're creating a lot of space in between them. And same thing with salinity. If you have higher salinity, you have more dense water because that salt molecule is taking up more of the empty spaces in between the water molecules versus low salinity water, which should have more space in between the water molecules. Therefore, when you look at density, um, you'll see that you'll have higher density water and you'll, and you'll have lower density water. And typically speaking, because the deep ocean is uh, on average about four degrees Celsius, the deep ocean is more dense, the water down there is more dense than it is at the surface. So when we look at these three graphs right here, you'll see they all have their own cline or area where they that, that parameter changes the most. So temperature has a permacline, salinity has a halocline, and density has a pycnocline. <clears throat> now if we talk about pressure, uh, what's really interesting about pressure is at the surface, we have what's known as one atmosphere of pressure. Um, so you sitting down listening to this audio, uh, this, uh, this video right now, you're sitting at one atmosphere of pressure. And in the, in the image there, that person uh, holding that balloon in the boat, he's also sitting at one atmosphere of pressure. But let's say he suits up, he takes that balloon down with him, and he gets down to 10 feet. Now, he is no longer at one atmosphere of pressure, he is at two atmospheres of pressure. And because he's still holding on to that balloon with air in it, he, he's adding more pressure to himself, so that balloon decreases in size by half, just at 10 meters deep. And if that diver continues down with that same balloon, once he gets down to um, 40 feet, he's already down at atmospheres of pressure so that balloon's getting really really small and by the time he gets down to 80 feet he is uh, down at nine atmospheres of pressure so that's a lot of pressure you can see that balloon is barely anything at all but if he were to come back up um, that balloon would expand back out so essentially what's going on is all of the space in between the air molecules are being compressed or is being released as the diver goes down. So in this case, just remember that for every 10 feet you go down below the ocean surface, you have to add one atmosphere of pressure. Don't worry about the bars or the PSI, just worry about the atmospheres. So you have the one atmosphere at the surface, and then when you go down every 10 meters, you have to add one one atmosphere on top of that. So at 10 meters, it'll be two, three, um, 20 meters, it'll be three, and so forth and so forth. All right, so now um, gases in the ocean have to um, abide by the law of physics. <laughs> and typically, atmospheric gases that you find um, above the surface of the water will dissolve. Well, into the ocean and this is known as gas exchange and typically the ones that um, go through gas exchange with the ocean are oxygen carbon dioxide and nitrogen when we get into the climate change uh, lecture we'll talk more about um, why carbon dioxide uh, why it's such a big deal that we talk about carbon dioxide going into the ocean and how much of it is going into the ocean. But generally speaking, 
gases will dissolve better in colder water and that's because the molecules are not moving around as quickly. Um, when you think about gases uh, dissolving into warm water, those water molecules are moving around really quickly and they tend to kick out whatever gas, let's just say oxygen or carbon dioxide, that dissolves into the water. So it'll kick it right back into the atmosphere versus in the colder water, it just kind of holds the gas there once it's dissolved. But typically speaking, you won't see a very high concentration of oxygen in the ocean through uh, gas exchange. Now, we do have high levels of oxygen in the ocean because of biology. Uh, so when uh, plankton and algae uh, do photosynthesis, they release oxygen. And so that is the primary mode of getting oxygen into the ocean. It's not through gas exchange. Because as you can see here, typically about four to six milliliters per liter of oxygen is dissolved into the ocean from the atmosphere versus the atmosphere having about 210 milliliters per liter. So that's a huge difference right there. Um, typically speaking, carbon dioxide will readily dissolve into the ocean uh, much more than oxygen will. So here on the next slide is just a graphical depiction of <clears throat> what uh, we just talked about. So you can see gas exchange there. Um, you can see photosynthesis from the uh, phytoplankton, um, aerosols, rain. So all of this, everything that happens in the atmosphere uh, will contribute to uh, chemistry and physics in the, in the ocean itself. And lastly, let's talk about the Coriolis effect because uh, everything on Earth is affected by Coriolis. And Coriolis just means that it's the apparent deflection of an object in motion. So when you throw uh, a, a baseball to your friend, it, if you're just standing on still, on still land, it doesn't look like it's doing anything at all. You're just throwing it to your friend and your friend catches it, hopefully. <clears throat> But if you're throwing a baseball to your friend on a merry-go-round that's actively moving, and if you throw that, that um, baseball directly to your friend and you don't account for the movement of the merry-go-round, your friend's not going to be able to catch it no matter how good of a catcher he is. And that's because that baseball gets deflected either to the right or to the left, uh, depending on what what rotation that merry-go-round is going around in. So if it's going in a clockwise rotation, then that baseball will be def deflected to the right. Yeah. I believe so. Um, and so that happens with anything that's in motion on Earth. So for instance, the currents in the um, are affected by the Coriolis and tend to be deflected around ocean basins. So on the next slide, you can just see um, a moving image, a GIF, of Coriolis in action. So it depends on what perspective you're looking at, whether you are on the platform or if you're off the platform. Uh, it'll depend on what you see. So if you're on the platform, you won't be able to see the deflection of the moving object. But if you're off of the spinning platform, that, that's when you'll be able to see um, that object being deflected either to the right or to the left. All right, so uh, this, that was it for this physics section. Um, next, we'll talk about fundamentals of biology uh, for zoology. And if you are in oceanography, the next topic we'll talk about is air-sea interaction.